Missionary Baptist Church. I baptize you in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Caitlin. We got back to back Caitlin's this morning. This one's fine. the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Yes. By your profession of faith, and by the authority of Crossroads Missionary Baptist Church, I baptize you in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey. Do you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, your personal Savior? Yes, by your profession of faith and by the authority of Crossroads Missionary Baptist Church, I baptize you in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come on, we got plenty of time. <laughs> Christ, your personal Savior. By your profession of faith and by the authority of Crossroads Missionary Baptist Church, I baptize you in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You okay? <laughs> all right, what's well, a great way to start the morning off? We're so excited to have you all here with us this morning. And uh, we pray that uh, God will bless our worship together, and he's ar he already has. All right? So, uh, Brother Mark, I turn it over to you. <laughs> Welcome to Crossroads Missionary Baptist Church. It's wonderful to have you with us here this morning to worship Jesus Christ. And what a great way to start our services. If you're visiting with us this morning, there's a place in your bulletin. You can fill out some information. And if you put that in the offering plate, that will go around right after our meet and greet this morning. The offering has moved to a, a new time in our service. Um, so if you'll fill that out during our meet and greet time and place that in the offering plate when it goes around, then we'll have a record of your visit with us. If right now we could all stand and let's welcome one another in the name of the Lord. couldn't make it this morning and my mom just happened to be in town and I said mom would you mind singing a special 
And so on the fly, she said, sure. And so uh, my mom is going to come sing for us, living for Jesus as soon as we uh, pray and bless this offering. morning with a thankful heart thank you for allowing us to be able to come into your house we just pray that uh, all that we do here just uh, lift your name on high that give you all the honor and glory we just ask that you'll be with this offering and uh, you'll bless it and uh, we use it in a way that's according to your will we ask these things in christ's name amen Amen. Let's stand and sing, brethren, we have met to worship.
stick all some of this stuff down here for you. Get started. All right. Good morning. Is everybody glad they're here this morning? It's already been worth the trip, hasn't it? It's already been good. Aren't you glad you woke up this morning? <laughs> you know, the, the uh, alternative to that, it's not so great. So uh, I'm glad y'all woke up this morning. I'm glad y'all are all here. Some of y'all will be thinking about that for a little while. Eventually you'll get it and you'll be like, oh, yeah. But uh, it's great to have y'all all here this morning. You know, a few weeks, well, a couple months ago um, on Father's Day, I preached from Ephesians chapter 5 and a little bit of verse si- uh, chapter 6. And uh, now that we're going through Ephesians, we're back to that point again. And I thought, well, should I do this or should I not? So I talked to some of you, and I found out apparently you weren't paying attention the last time, so we're going to go through this again. All right? So uh, it's glad to, I'm glad to have all of you here, and it's good to, to see you. Uh, i got a question. How many of you are or have been married at some point? All right? How many of you hope to be someday? All right, all right. All right, all right, I saw those over there, yeah, yeah, all right, that's good, that's good. Then listen up, you need this, okay, pay close attention today, because this is God's blueprint, you don't want to mess with it, you start messing with it, you get some faulty building going on in your marriage, and things will collapse, you don't want that, all right, so today we're going to read from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33. All right, and as we do that, think about this. We've been learning in this book, as uh, Paul's been writing to the church at Ephesus, how to be a church, right? And we've learned that harmony and unity in the church only comes when the people are filled with the Spirit, right? Well, let me tell you something. Harmony and unity in the home only comes when we're also filled with the Spirit and allowing God to direct us. Okay, you can watch all of the self-help stuff and you can watch the view six times a day. And it is not going to help you to fix your marriage. It is not going to help you to have a healthy relationship with your spouse or with your kids. God's word. This is where we find the blueprint that we need. This is where we are. The fi- we find the direction that we need. This is what the Holy Spirit will use to direct us. And we will be filled with the Holy Spirit in our homes. Because guess what? Our homes are very important. The home has been under attack for years. And it's time that we, you know, get a battle plan. And here's the battle plan right here. If you'll stand with me and we read together from Ephesians chapter 5. Beginning in verses, and beginning in verse 22. Now, you ladies, don't get upset as we start this, okay? It's going to come back around, all right? All right. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we pray that you just speak to our hearts today, God, that you just Lead us in this service where you want us to be. God, that uh, you will change lives here today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. 
So we've talked about the book of Ephesians, and this, this, this letter is all about how the church is supposed to act, right? And uh, for some reason, we seem to have difficulty sometimes understanding that if we should be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving, walking in humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to mean, maintain unity at home, just as we do at church. We should be all those things that he's told us to be as a church, we should be as a family. Eager to maintain unity, not eager to get our way. Loving, tender-hearted, bearing with one another. All those things that we've been talking about over the last several weeks that we're supposed to be here together. We're supposed to be there together as well. You know, I was walking through Lifeway this week and I saw a book I know Jack would love. I haven't read the book, but I saw the title as I was looking for a different book. I saw this title of this book and it said, Stop Going to Church. Because, you know, Ever since Jack's been alive, every Sunday morning he's going, oh, we got to go to church. Let's, this morning he told Cindy, he said, I think we should stop doing this church thing. <laughs> but that's what the title of the book was. In Lifeway, he said, stop going to church. And I don't have a clue what that book is about, but I know what it would be about if I wrote it. And if I had written that book, I would have said, stop going to church and start being the church. Because church is not someplace you go. Church is who we are. We are the church. You want to know about Crossroads Missionary Baptist Church? You don't need to see the building plan, how this place is laid out. You don't need to know how many acres we have. You don't need those things. What you need to know is these people. These people who are in this place. We are the church. So when we talk about how we are to be the church, that is not just what we are in this building. It is what we are and who we are everywhere we go. Because you need to remember, tomorrow morning when you go to work, you take Crossroads Missionary Baptist Church with you. Because in that place, you represent us. You are our ambassadors there. But more importantly, you are Jesus' ambassador there. You represent Christ, which is even bigger, way bigger. So as he's telling us how to represent him, how to be his church, we need to recognize that that is not just here. That's everywhere we go. All right? And the message in these verses, as we talk about husbands and wives, and even as we talk about children and uh, employees and that kind of relationship, as you get into chapter 6, all of this stuff, it talks about this, this one theme. And he says, do it as unto Christ. As unto Christ. You'll see that over and over. As unto Christ or as Christ. Everything here is about Jesus. And if we will set our minds to that, and people say, how do you have a Christ-centered relationship? How do you have a marriage or a family that is Christ-centered? Here it is. All right? That doesn't mean that you all, all have We Love Jesus t-shirts that you put on every morning when you wake up and you have, you know, pancakes that are shaped like the Bible or something weird like that. It's not about that stuff. All right? Having a Christ-centered relationship and a marriage that is built on the Word of God and those kind of things is doing everything you do together as unto Christ. And keeping Christ and His Word at the center of all that you do and remembering that that is your motivation. Okay? In Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. It should be that everything we do, at home, at work, at church, in the car, wherever we are, we should do it as if we're doing it for Jesus. And we should do it in His name. And we should be proud to do that. If you say, I'm not going to do that in Jesus' name, well, then you don't need to do that. It's real simple. Okay? So the next two weeks, or, or maybe we may get it all in this week, I don't know, but we're going to be taking a look at our relationships. And the heart of relationships is do it as unto Christ. All right? All right. Now, that being said, 
And before we get into the marriage thing and all this relationship stuff, let's take a quick look at what these verses say about Jesus. Okay? Because these verses tell us a lot about Jesus. Because, you know, when Paul wraps this up, he says, this, is, this mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. And then he says, however, don't forget, it also refers to the family and to the relationships at home and your marriage and those things. Those things are important. But hey, saying while we look at this, remembering that he's talking about Jesus Christ and his church. So what is most important here is that we see that Christ is the head and we are the body. We are not the head. Do y'all know that? At this church, we are not the head. We are just the body. We do what the head tells us to do. We're led by him completely. All right? He is the head. We are his body. He is our Savior. And if we are here this morning, or if you are here this morning, and he is not your Savior, he wants to be. Let me promise you that. God is not willing that a single person should leave this earth without trusting Jesus Christ. He wants every single one of you. He wants all of us. He wants us. He wants us so much that he gave his only begotten son to die in our place. So if you say, you know, nobody wants me. God wants you. He proved it on the cross when he gave his son to die in your place. So if you're here this morning and you say, I'm not worth saving. Yes, you are. You say, I'm not sure how to be saved. Let me tell you, the Bible is very clear. You know, the apostle Paul was in prison, and I've used this example many times, and he's there in prison with Silas, and they're singing, and all this stuff's going on, and the chains fall off, and the, the prison guard runs up, the jailer, and he's like, oh, no, oh, no, it's terrible. And Paul yells out, do yourself no harm. We're all still here. And the Philippian jailer runs in in Acts chapter 16, and he says, Paul, tell me everything I need to know about Christ. And Paul laid it out, and he started pulling out the scrolls and teaching deep theology. No, he didn't do any of those things. He, the jailer said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You want Jesus to be your Savior this morning? Put all your trust in Him. That's what it takes. Stop trusting in the church to save you. Stop trusting in your goodness to save you. Jesus Christ and Him alone. That is who will save you. If you trust Him and ask Him to do it. He loves us. He gave himself for us that he might sanctify, present us to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that we may be holy and without blemish. All those things he says about the church and that is us if we've trusted him as our Savior and followed him. That's who we are. That's who Jesus is. So let's take a look at how this relates to our relationships to one another. Okay? Beginning in verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. I like that verse. Always have. One of my favorites. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and he himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. What is submission, gentlemen? I'm not asking ladies, I'm asking gentlemen. What is submission? Okay. I think I've recognized, pin, we've pinpointed the problem here. We don't know what this means. Submission, is it a noun? Is it a verb? Is it, is it about pushing somebody down? It about what is submission submission is something that a that has to be given right it's a verb and what what we're talking about here is something that a wife is to do not something that is supposed to be forced on her right because forced submission is not submission it's not you can't take someone and make them your slave even if they do what you tell them to do. They have never submitted to you. They are only doing what they have to do for self-preservation. That's not submission. Submission has to be given. Submission is a verb. It is something that 
you do. It's not something that's forced on you. Did he, did he ever say, did he say, husbands, see that your wife submits? No. He said, wives, submit to your husbands. Make that choice. Submission is a sign of trust and respect, right? So husbands, what does he say to us? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he may sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as, the, as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated wow, his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Guess what, guys? We got a lot more to do than she does, don't we? Sounds like we got a big long list. She said, he said, submit to your husbands. Okay, husbands, here's what I want you to do. But what was the first thing? What do you do? Love, right? Husbands, love your wives. Husbands are to love. Love is also a verb, right? Is love a verb? Absolutely. It means you care more for her than you do for yourself. It's to cherish, to protect, to dote over her. Y'all ever been doted over? That's a good thing, right? Nobody ever says, oh, I don't want to be doted over. I just want to be treated like garbage. No. We want to be doted over. That's nice. That's good. We like that. Men should have outgrown that by now, men. But that's something that women need all their lives. And some of us men, I've, I've, I've heard over the years, they say, you know what? I just can't do it. I don't love her anymore. That's your choice. You chose that. All right? People say, you can't help who you fall in love with. Bull. That's bull. You choose. You make that choice. You say, well, you know, so-and-so and I at work, we started having lunch and all these things, and we never meant for this to happen, but it just happened. Bull. You chose that. You made decisions that led to that. Husbands, if you say, I can't love her, make yourself. Make yourself love her. Treat, treat her like you love her and see what happens. You know, in Matthew, I think I wrote this down this morning in Sunday school when it popped into my head. Chapter 6, verse 21. I want to make sure I got that right. because Some of y'all are going to go look that up later. Matthew 6, 21, Jesus is talking and he's at the end of the Sermon on the Mount and he's, he's talking to people and he says, Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, right? And what, what did he say? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You treat her like you love her. You dote on her. You just devote yourself to her and see what happens. You know what's going to happen? Your heart's going to follow. This is a principle that works throughout your life. If you say, I, don't, I just don't love her anymore, start acting like you love her, and guess what will happen? You'll start loving her again. You say, I just don't care about kids. Start spending time on your kids or on some kids. And guess what will happen? You'll start loving kids. I don't have a heart for the lost. Start spending some time on lost people. And guess what will happen? You'll develop a heart for the lost. Because where your treasure is, there your heart will follow. You start spending your time, your treasure, your money, whatever it is, on the things that you want to care about. And you will begin to care about them. If you want to have a deep and abiding love for Walmart, go buy a bunch of stock in Walmart and see what happens. Okay? Where your treasure is, your heart will follow. Men, love your wives. It's a choice. It's a verb. If he had said, men, kick your wives, y'all wouldn't have a problem with that, would you? I know exactly how to do it. It's a verb. It's the same thing. Love your wives. Something we are supposed to do. We are called to do. Now, do y'all see the difference between, did he ever say, wives love your husband? In all this, all the way through, did you see that? Wives love your husbands? Why not? 
You'd think that would be fairly important, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Maybe not. I don't know. I'm getting a lot of, I don't know where you're going with this, preacher. You know, psychologists will tell you, social workers will tell you, anybody who's ever done a lot of marriage counseling can tell you, you know what a woman needs? Love. You know what a man needs? Respect. That's just the way it is. A man feels loved when he's respected. A woman feels respected when she's loved. Women need to be loved. Men need to be respected. That has taken the psychological world centuries to really figure out. But, you know, Paul wrote that a long time ago. He was before his time, wasn't he? But, you know, since God's the one that told him what to write, I guess it shouldn't really surprise us here. Listen, women need to be loved, so men, love your wives. Now I'm going to jump ship and get over here on the lady side for a minute. Lady, your husband needs to be respected. He needs that. He needs to feel respected. He needs to feel like he is the man. He needs that. He doesn't need you to, you know, dote on him. He should have outgrown that in his teens. He needs it, what he needs is to be respected. Then he feels like a man, and that's what he wants. Okay? So, you say, my husband's not deserving of my respect. Right? Kind of like those men a while ago said, I just don't love her. And some of you women are out there right now going, I just don't respect him. I want to respect him. I know God says I should respect him, but I don't. You know what you need to do? You think I'm going to say fake it. I'm not. You need to start praying for your husband and not praying that God will change him. That's not what you need to be praying. God, make my husband into the man that I deserve. No. He may already be that. All right? <laughs> Took y'all a minute on that one, but you know, y'all came around. I'm proud of you. <laughs> Listen, pray for him. Pray that he will be successful. And here, let him know that you're praying for his success. Mark and I talked about this a few weeks ago. You talk. When you're praying for your husband, let him hear you praying for him or tell him that you're praying about whatever. But don't sit there and pray, Dear Lord, I pray that you would just draw Jimmy Joe closer to you and help him to stop being such a loser, Lord, because we we, we know that uh, I need to be submitting to him and respecting him, but God, right now, I just don't have it in me. That kind of prayer is not going to help him at all. But when you pray and you say, Dear God, thank you for giving us Jimmy Joe as the head of our family. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen him as he leads us. Lord, I pray that you would give him success in his job and in the home and all these things. And God, I thank you for who you have given to me to lead me closer to you. And you mean that when you pray it. And then you know what your husband just found out? That you do respect him and that you expect something of him. You expect him to lead you closer to God. So what does that do? That lets him know in a roundabout way that he needs to get closer to God so he can lead you there. Listen, we men are fragile. Okay, we are. We're fragile. We're easy to manipulate. Manipulate us. Okay? Pray for us. But respect us, because that's what we need. We have a need for that. And when I say manipulate us, I don't mean nag us or do those things. I mean, let us know that you expect us to live up to this without nagging us about it, but through praying for us, through encouraging us, 
to grow in Christ so that we can lead you where God's called us to lead you. Right? What was it? He's to nourish and cherish her, love her as he loves his own body. How's he to treat his own body? Right? To nourish it and cherish it. He's to build a life for them to have together. He is to, what? Cleanse, it says Christ cleansed the church with the washing of water by the word. And he says that we're to do that too. How are you going to help your wife grow closer to Christ? How are you going to teach her the word of God if you don't know it yourself? Guys, this is our responsibility. And ladies, you make sure that you hold us accountable for this. And you young ladies, look right in here, right here. You make sure you hold those guys sitting around in the middle of y'all accountable to this too. Wherever you young girls are out there, you got these boys at high school that are trying to impress you with their trucks and their muscles. Tell them, you impress me with uh, the scripture. That'll impress me. You impress me that you care enough about me that you want to protect me. That you want to draw me closer to God and not closer to you. Because those guys that say, you know, sweetheart, if you really love me, then blah, blah, blah. You turn it around on him. You say, you know, if you really love me, you want me to be closer to God. And you wouldn't be trying to talk me into doing things that his word tells me not to do. So get out. If you'll start holding these guys a little bit more responsible and accountable, then when, they, when you grow up and you get married, this will all be set up already. Don't try to, uh, to live up to what the world tells you you want or what you need. You look at God's word. Use it as the standard all right it shouldn't be that a godly 16 year old boy is the rarest thing on the planet you know why they are sometimes in some places because the girls let them be you know one thing a guy a 16 year old boy wants more than anything <laughs> he wants his girlfriend or the girl he likes to be impressed by him, to respect him. And when you allow yourself to be you know, impressed by the wrong things, you're training him to be what you don't want. Young girls, young ladies, think about this. This is not just for the wives and the husbands. This is for the want-to-be wives and the hoping-to-be husbands. Okay? He needs to be Drawing you closer to Christ. It's, he has a lot of responsibility in this relationship. The culture's got it all wrong. Culture says that the women lead everything out. You know, the women drive everything. You know, where, what church are you going to go to when you get married? Well, she's a this, so I guess we'll go there because, you know, you kind of follow the women in religious things. And that's not right. All the responsibility here really is on the man. He's to be the head. He's the one to love. He's to give himself, to sanctify her, to present her in splendor and without blemish, to protect her physically, emotionally, spiritually, to protect her reputation. Those are all his responsibilities. So young men, live up to it. Old men, live up to it. God has called you to this, not me. He's to nourish her, cherish her. He's to build a life for them, I said a while ago. In verse 31, what does it say? Let's read it. Where is it? Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Guys, there is no escape hatch. All right? Some guys, you know, mom's still cooking. I can always go home if this don't work out. That's an escape hatch. You leave your father and mother and you build a life for your family. Hold fast. You know what that means? That means like your life depends on it. Hold fast. If you're on a helicopter, uh, a helicopter ladder, is that what they call those? Those hangy down ladders? You've seen them on movies. A little ladder that hangs down from the helicopter and the helicopter's flying over the city and you're holding onto that ladder. Hold fast. Think about that. 
Because you're not going to be like, hey, man, I'm like, oh, uh, no, you're going to be death grip. Your fingerprints will be permanently embedded on those little things. All right? That's the kind of grasp that we're talking about here when we say hold fast. Hold fast to your wife. You are one now. Hold fast. Leave your father and mother. Become one with your wife. No escape hatch. You don't want to be cut back in half again once you've become one, right? Because when you're one, you know, when you were two, you could split up. Oh, nobody, you know, but when you become one, then when you split up, there's surgery involved, right? You got to cut, be cut in half because you were one. Now you're trying to become two again. It should be painful. It should be hard. It shouldn't be easy. And once again, in verse 32, he makes the comparison to Christ and the church. We've talked about that. And look at verse 33. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see she respects her husband. Once again, he backs that up. What do women need? Love. What do men need? Respect. When those things happen, what happens? Good stuff. Healthy relationship. Men, be the kind of, uh, be the kind of husband that your wife can't help but respect. She wants to submit to you. She trusts you in every way. She wants to submit to you because she knows you are trustworthy. Be that man. And women, help him to be that man by not belittling, but through respecting. And if you can't respect him, respect his position as the head and help him to be able to fulfill his obligations and his responsibilities. You know, if every wedding in America included this as a prenup, if this was the prenuptial agreement, that I, I will, you know, by punishment of law, submit to my husband, and that the husband will love his wife and do all these things that, the, that Ephesians chapter 5 says he's supposed to do, and if that was the prenuptial agreement, man, divorce lawyers would go out of business. Instead of it worrying about who gets this and who gets that, if we worried about actually doing what we say we're going to do when we get married in the first place, it would be so much bigger, so much better. And you know why? Because this actually works. God invented us. He invented marriage. He knows how it's supposed to work together. And this is the simple direction right here. Listen. In our culture today, the institution of marriage is under attack. The family is under attack. I don't want you to sit here today and feel like you are under attack. Some of you in this room right now have been through divorce. And you know better than I do how painful it is. You know better than I do how what that it is not a good thing. Making anybody feel bad about their past in here today is not our goal. It's not about that. It's about encouragement for the future. It's about taking this and applying it to your life today and from here forward. From here all the way through. This is what it's about. It's going starting today. It's not about your past. It's not about that. It's not about past failures. Because i got a lot of past failures. I don't want to bring them all up in here. But I've got a lot of hope for the future. As I read these, these words, I see where my marriage can go. And I've got a great marriage. My wife has a wonderful husband. And I have a wonderful wife. We have a happy family. But when I look at this, I still see what I could be doing. I see where I can improve. I see how God is calling me 
to all these things. And I know today He's calling you to these things as well. We see hope for the future. Help for today. We're not here today to get beat up. God didn't bring you here for that. He brought you here today so He could speak to your heart. Speak to my heart. And I know He has. The question is now, what are we going to do? Are we going to walk out of here feeling bad about past decisions? I hope not. Will we learn from those past mistakes? Yes. I pray that we will. Will we see God's plan for what He wants us to do? I hope we will. The question is, are we going to submit or are we going to ignore Him? Submission to God. You know, some of you wives need to be praying for your husbands. You need to be right here in this place today praying for your husband. He may be here with you. He may not be here with you. But I guarantee you, he needs you to be praying for his success as the leader and the head of your family. Some of you wives need to be praying for your husbands. Some of you husbands need to be praying for your wives and praying for yourselves. That you'll be able to love her the way God has called you to love her. It's a big responsibility to love your wife like Christ loves the church. It's a big responsibility. It's a big thing. I know all of us here this morning, we need to submit to Jesus. Whatever it is, we need to submit to Him. Follow His example. As He loves us, so we should love one another. Especially in the home. We should follow His Word. Trust Him. And submit to whatever it is He's talking to us about today. Whatever it is He's talking to your heart about today, submit. Don't ignore. As we have a time of invitation, this is your time to allow God to move you. Whatever it is he's talking to you about today, submit, please. Stand with me just for a moment, and let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for this morning. God, we thank you for your word. God, we pray that as you've spoken to our hearts today, God, that uh, we've been listening. God, we pray that you'll give each one of us the courage, the strength this morning to submit to you to trust you in every way. God, we love you. We praise you for who you are. We thank you so much for Jesus. We ask this in his holy and precious name. Amen. Allow God to move you this morning, whatever it may be. If you need to talk to me, you need to talk to Brother Josh. We're here for you this morning. If you just need to pray, pray. You can pray here. You can pray where you are. Allow God to have his way in your heart this morning. As we sing.
sing just now, I Surrender All. Dylan has come forward this morning to surrender his life to the gospel ministry. All right, he's, he's heard the call of God to preach the word and he is surrendering himself. He's not just answering the call, he's surrendering to the ministry. And uh, we're so happy, we're so excited for Dylan. I know he's, he's talked to Josh and I both and uh, we know that uh, he is on fire in fact i'm scared to touch him he's so hot for god right now you know what but i tell you what i'd love to see uh, anyone who wants to come up and just pray for dylan let's just uh let's let's pray for dylan this morning and uh encourage him that god is going to uh to just bless his ministry use him in a mighty way um so anybody who would like to come forward and pray for dylan uh we're going to do that in just right now let's do it now let's not put that off let's go ahead and do that now all right Dylan Hildebrandt, I don't think I said his last name for those who may not know. I'll get out of the way. <laughs> amen, amen. Oh, there it is. Father, first, that you are holy, that you are sovereign God. And, Father, I thank you for Dylan and his boldness. And, Father, I, I pray that you use his life. Give him strength. Give him power. Give him wisdom. Give him knowledge. Father, to preach your word, to, to further your kingdom. Father, he's given his life as a vessel. Father, we just pray that you use that vessel to honor and glorify you. And, Father, I, just, I pray that, that there may be someone out there that will hear the gospel because of Dylan's choice to surrender his life to you. Father, I, I just pray that... You, you, uh, you bless his life, uh, use his family to encourage him, use us to encourage him, and Father, that we may never forget that, uh, that Dylan is, is so willing to, to give his life to you. Father, I just pray that you use that, use that decision to further your kingdom. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what he did on the cross. We, we, uh, we love you. We ask for forgiveness for our sins. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, as you're making your way back to your seat, a few announcements, and Dylan, we're going to have Dylan out back when we get finished here, and y'all can all go by and shake his hand and love him and encourage him, because um, I'm, I'm proud of him. Yeah, you can go ahead and have a seat. If you're at your seat, if you're still walking, wait till you get to the pew where you were sitting earlier and sit there. All right, just a few announcements we want to get through real fast. Don't forget, the Back to School Bash was a huge success, had a huge crowd of folks there, a lot of them I'd never seen before in my life, and that's what I like. Of course, you know, for me, that's not that big a deal. I don't know that many people here yet. But I was very excited to see a lot of new faces. And I know that God is going to bless our uh, ministries these, uh, through the school year. And uh, don't forget um, to be praying for that. And if you have not yet volunteered to help with that, please do so. All right? We don't want any students to uh, miss out on the gospel of Christ just because there was uh, a short fall in uh, in workers or in something like that all right we had somewhere between 350 to 400 people there wednesday night the youth band did a great job we ran out of food and that's always good unless you're the guy who was supposed to order the food because then everybody gets mad at you but we know it was a big crowd because we ran out of food all right so that's a very good night uh, don't forget about the food pantry there's still uh, some needs there to be filled if you look inside your bulletin those are listed for you uh, we need bus drivers and riders, uh, sound and video guys still. We still need security and grounds watchers. I know that everybody here is qualified to do that job. Uh, if you don't want to do anything else, you can still do that, all right? Um, 
the midweek Bible study will be back in the library over here with Brother uh, Robert James, and that will start at 6 o'clock. It says here, is that 6.30 actually? Yeah, 6.30. It should be 6.30. All right, the men's uh, group is going to be starting up in September. All right, a lot of stuff planned there. So look forward to hearing a lot of news coming up over the next uh, couple of weeks for that. All right, this week um, is, what, which one of these, which is these, I don't know. Is this the third Sunday or is this the fourth Sunday? Today's the fourth Sunday. All right, orchestra today at 445. All right, every other week at 445, choir, orchestra, choir, orchestra. Today is orchestra. All right, so be here for that if you're in the orchestra. Don't forget about our, uh, the new name for the student ministry. I know Josh got some little bracelets made, and there's all kinds of cool stuff going on there. A lot of excitement over uh, the new theme, I guess we'll call it, for the youth ministry. I know God's going to do some amazing things there. All right, I'm glad to have all of you here this morning. It's been a great blessing for me. I hope it's been a blessing for you. I hope God has spoken to your heart and you have surrendered to him this morning. Don't forget, even though the invitation's over, it's never over. All right? I'll be out back. Our staff will be standing around. If you have questions or you need anything, please grab one of us. That's why we're here. Um, the invitation is always open. Anything that you need, you please, please let us know if you've got questions or whatever, anything like that. All right? Let me pray with you one more time, and then Brother Mark is going to, uh, we're going to go out of here this morning singing a song. All right? Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for this day, Lord. Thank you for the moves that have been made, Lord, this morning, for the way you've spoken to our hearts. God, we pray that you will continue to speak to our hearts. God, continue to remind us everything we do is about you, that we are your church. God, that we are to re represent you in our homes, in our workplace, in the stores, everywhere we go, God, we represent you. And, Lord, that's a huge responsibility, and we pray that you will help us to remember that. We never take that lightly. God, we love you. We pray for the families in this church. We pray for the families in this country. God, that you will help men to be men, help women, wives to submit. Lord, that families will be blessed. God, we love you. We praise you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.